These dioramas of otherworldly creatures, machines, and structures weave together a web of stories from a planet where an invasive fungus has taken over. Today, we're traveling eastwards to Chokara, where a fascinating discovery is about to be made. I'll show you how I designed, sculpted, and crafted this model. Then, I'll narrate my newest short story. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. While intricate kit-bashing projects and fiddly structure designs are fun, they're also exhausting. On the other hand, digging my fingers into a lump of formless clay and watching a creation emerge is exhilarating. At the same time, I wanted to really push my boundaries here with a lush scene teeming with alien flora. So I decided to set this diorama in the equatorial tropic of Aegis in Chakara. This humid, swampy, wooded setting was perfect for the build, and since it had been a long time since I'd last created any new species, I decided to design an insect, something akin to a centipede with a few significant deviations. As always, the idea was roughly sketched onto this cold press watercolor paper, and then I went over all the details and brush pens and felt tips. I spent longer than usual layering colors and balancing the final palette. I did this by adding one color at a time to different parts of the design so that the end result didn't feel too heavy with a dominating color. My heart wasn't set on this exact palette, of course, as I like to experiment and make mistakes here rather than on the actual build. While I was mostly happy with this concept, it felt a little bare without some sort of a Jeezian tech, but I decided to come back to it later. The centerpiece of this build was an old tree stump, which would be at a scale much larger than I'd previously attempted. I started with aluminum foil, sculpted into a rough shape, then cut some short lengths of 1mm armature wire. The wire was wrapped in more foil and used to create the jagged strips of dried wood. After laying out some parchment paper, I got out my bin of polymer clay. For the tree stump, I used Sargent brand polymer clay, to which you can find a link in the video's description. After having sat untouched in its bin for months, the clay was quite hard and crumbly, but a few quick run-throughs on the roller warmed it right up, making it malleable. To achieve a rough, bark-like texture, I scored these strips of polymer clay, then tore, rather than cut them, lengthwise. I then gently press the strips onto the foil armature, careful not to rub away the texture. This is the fourth time I've attempted wood grain texture in one of my Beyond the Blight builds, but the first time using this particular technique, and I think the results turned out the best. For this giant knot hole, I ran a thick rope of clay through the clay roller, which gave the edges this cracked effect. I then layered several strips of the clay atop one another, looped it into a circle, and attached. I then came back with dental tools, files, and an assortment of other implements to carve in details like cracks, scrapes, and chips. For the branches, I wound a bundle of armature wire together, then peeled away the offshoots one stem at a time. The branches were then covered in torn strips of clay as before. Holes were added to the stump, and the branches were attached. Finally, some tiny clay loops helped fuse it all together. Texture was then added with foil and tools to create a uniform look. Next, tiny bark chips were stuck on to give an aged appearance. 
After a quick bake in the oven, I airbrushed everything with a primer coat of black. I did this now because it was a lot easier painting the inside of the stump before it was attached to the base. To really bring this scene to life, I needed a swath of vibrant plants. To craft them, I put together this document in Photoshop using stock photos, scans, and artwork of tropical leaves. Then, without moving any of it, I created an outline of all the shapes and saved this selection as an SVG file, which is readable by a laser cutter. The tricky thing here, of course, is getting everything properly aligned, since the cuts needed to be very precise. To do this, I created a rectangle the size of my printer paper, engraved that onto a piece of cardstock, then used this as a footprint for the printed paper of leaves. This ensured that the cuts would line up, more or less. For the bits that didn't quite turn out, I did some touching up with an X-Acto blade, and in some cases, colored in the edges with pencils. I then applied glossy Mod Podge to give the leaves a shiny, waxy finish. Of course, at this point only the tops of the leaves had any color, so I stuck them upside down to this bit of cardstock, then airbrushed everything dark green. Once all the foliage was painted and bent to make it look more leaf-like, I added some stems and was satisfied with the results. I was super eager to get started on the fungi part of this build, which was done entirely with colorful polymer clay. To get the desired pattern shown on the bracket fungi here, I rolled out thin strips of clay in various colors. I then cut these strips into similarly sized widths. The strips were then rolled around one another, layer by layer, until I ended up with a psychedelic sushi roll. These cylinders were then rolled into various sized thinner ropes, then sliced into very thin discs. For the mushrooms on the forest floor, I first sculpted these orange conical discs, being sure to add holes to the bottom for the stems later. To clean up the fingerprints, I also brushed on some isopropyl alcohol. I then baked the caps in the oven, added armature wire for the stems bases, then a thin disc of clay for the caps undersides. With these sides smoothed out and textured, I then wound a bit of foil around the wire, then a strip of smoothed out clay. Once attached to the underside with a ball stylus, I added the partial veil with another thin strip of clay. Then came the spore flecks. These were created by rolling out some crumbly old white clay, curing with a heat gun, doing a bit of extra slicing and dicing, coating the caps in glossy Mod Podge, then sprinkling on the gritty spore garnish. Finally, a touch of rust-colored weathering powder gave a bit more dimension to the final appearance. As with my last build, I traced out the base's shape in pencil, then used a wire cutter to quickly extricate the desired shape. A wire cutter is one of those tools I held off getting for a long time, but it's absolutely essential if you want to achieve this sort of result. To ensure that everything would stick to this surface, I scuffed up the foam with a wire brush, then mixed up a batch of texture paste, plaster of Paris, water, Mod Podge, and dried moss. After smearing this texture onto the base and being overcome with a sudden craving for dill cream cheese spread, I attached the stump, then refined the seams with a brush and some water. With the paste still wet, I pressed in some twigs I had prepared the day before, then added a ton of tiny holes for all the decorations that were to come later. The entire base was then primed in black acrylic, again with my airbrush. I was a little unsure of priming a dark color here, since I usually add washes to a light primer color, but this method of using more opaque colors on a black primer coat 
worked out really well, which you'll see later on. To create a more obvious connection to the rest of my world, I knew I needed some sort of Agesian technology. One of my patrons suggested a dismembered Automeca head, which I liked. I designed the head one morning in Blender, starting with a mirrored cube, and slowly adding loop cuts and extrusions for detail. Subtractive Boolean forms made for some nice events on the sides of the head, and once the head was modeled, I positioned it vertically on a slower print speed to minimize print lines. The result was close to what I wanted, but it still required some filing and wire brushing to get the best possible finish. I usually save the most challenging part of the build for last, and with this project, it was definitely the enormous multi-legged centipede. After a bit of research into actual centipede physiology, I decided to divide the sculpture into more manageable segments that I'd later attach together. Once the 19 segments were built from wire, foil, and masking tape, I used a pin vise to drill holes into their sides, then strung the segments together along a length of fine wire like a necklace. I next used this firm polymer clay to wrap the head, then used a ball stylus to make indentations for the pre-cooked, pre-hardened clay eyes. I also had the common sense here to number the body segments for later assembly, as individually wrapping them in clay was much easier when they weren't strung together. With that done, I placed them back on the wire, baked everything, then embarked on the tedious process of posing. After applying some masking tape to the bottom to keep the segments in place, I added these segmented clay legs, partially cured in place with my heat gun, then carefully posed the appendages. Eventually, I was able to sculpt several sets of leg at a time before curing, but it was a painstaking process nonetheless. Finally, to lock it all in place, I added some two-part epoxy putty between each of the body segments. Silicone sculpting tools and a bit of water made for a relatively smooth process here. I then went back to add details to the head, like these mandibles and forcipules, then cured with a heat gun. I then repeated the epoxy step on each of the appendage joints, and once that was dry and everything was set, I added the chitinous scales with polymer clay. And with all that done, it was time for painting and assembly, and of course, the short story. Turning to the next slide on your console display, you will note the brightly colored Chokaran centipede, an equatorial species found solely in the region with which it shares its nomenclature. The professor paused as a predictable wave of gasps washed over the audience. A faint smirk tugged at the corner of his thin lips before he cleared his voice and continued. <clears throat> as you can plainly see, this species shares many characteristics with a common arthropod, a single pair of legs per body segment, venom-laden forcipules, a pair of forward-facing antennae, and mandibles. Of course, the obvious exception to these norms is its extraordinary size. With a flick of his forearm, the lecturer's wrist stripe triggered the next slide on the students' desk consoles. On their screens, an armed soldier lay beside the dead specimen of the enormous insect, his smile betrayed by the unsettled sidelong glance he cast upon the creature, which was nearly twice his length. There are other significant deviations seen in this species, such as the elongated legs attached to the segments nearest the creature's head, along with two rows of conspicuously large eyes, features absent in other species. 
The professor paused here to sip from the steaming mug atop his desk, then glanced up at his audience, noting with some irritation a raised hand. He frowned, ignored it, and continued with his speech. Research on the Chokaran centipede has proven difficult. The regions of Chokara it is typically found in are quite inhospitable to humans, making observation and study impractical. In his audience, the lone hand jutting from the sea of heads began to wave impatiently. And of course, any entomologist willing to venture into these territories must take precautions against the spore clouds, and yes, Mr. Kosh, what is your question? Like ripples in a pond, heads began turning to face the student. What of their sterility? he asked. The professor gaped at him, surprised as much by the question's brevity as its content. I beg your pardon? Ekrite entomologist Rij Pilana published a study last year claiming that these Chokaran aberrations are not able to reproduce. The professor's eyes narrowed as the students in the room turned back to him, waiting for a response. Face reddening, he removed and cleaned his glasses on the sleeve of his shirt. When it comes to the blight, there is no shortage of rumors and hearsay. What we need are hard facts, not conjecture. This was a peer-reviewed study. Pilana was able to capture more than a dozen specimens and recreate a suitable habitat for them in his lab. The professor could not keep the scowl from his face as he crossed his arms. If you know so much about this subject, perhaps you should apply for a position among our faculty, Mr. Kosh, he sneered. I am merely posing a question. If these creatures cannot reproduce, why are they so prevalent? Where are they coming from? Aren't these questions we should be discussing, rather than some sensational photographs that teach us nothing? He lost them, the professor knew. The stubborn student's fervor for the topic had deterred any support among his classmates, who were now casting him derisive glances and whispering among themselves. Their biggest concern was life after their education, and many of the elite's children would surely find a way off-world. Furthering their studies of the critters under their feet was the farthest thing from their minds. Sensing this, the professor seized the opportunity to squelch the troubling topic. Regardless of your heritage, Mr. Kosh, we are Koseki. This university was founded on the principles of the original royals of the planet, and we pay little attention to the primitive research of infidel Ekrite enclaves. The insistence of the Corseki to make everything political will be their downfall. Mark my words, the young student shouted, rising from his seat. He stared frantically around the room, but found no sympathy in the faces there. I think, Mr. Kosh, said the professor in a low, cold tone, that it is time for you to leave. Thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to help support me and my work, consider checking out GameyBuilds.com for tons of Beyond the Blight merch, including these brand new back-printed Jogari shirts. Until next time, this is Gamey Builds. Over and out.